Good evening. I call the June 24th meeting of the Park Hill Board of Education to order. Mrs. Newberger is joining us by phone. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before I call for announcements, I would like to remind the board of our norms. Be prepared, display integrity, remain mission-driven and goal-focused, stay in the role of a board member, no grandstanding, and speak and listen respectfully. Um, any announcements this evening? Mr. Fain? None, thank you. Mrs. Reed? None, thank you. Mr. Monsas? None, thank you. Mr. Klein? None, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Newberger? None, thank you. Mrs. Woodley? None, thank you. I don't have anything. Dr. Coward? Uh, no, I don't have anything. Thank you. Okay. We'll need a motion and a second to adopt the June 24th agenda as presented. So moved. Second. I have a motion from Mrs. Reed and a second by Mrs. Woodley to ad adopt the agenda as presented. Dr. Coward, are there any modifications? Not the same, but board, I would remind you that you did get a late email around our transfers uh, from Dr. Kelly, and so those have been updated on the board agenda. Board, do you have any modifications? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Ah. Hey. Motion carries 7 0. Uh, we'll move on to recognitions and awards, and I'll turn it over to Ms. Kirby. Thank you so much. We have a couple recognitions this evening. We have three, two uh, student recognitions and a staff recognition. Our first is of a National Merit Scholar. You heard earlier in the year how we had several National Merit finalists and National Merit Commended Scholars. Um, um, it is rare for someone to get the actual National Merit Scholarship, um, but Amy Blevins from Park Hill South High School, uh, who recently graduated, is a National Merit Scholar. So uh, she is um, one of only 7,500 in the country that achieved that. Um, there were 16,000 finalists and 1.6 million students who entered the scholarship program by taking the PSAT. So we're very proud of her achievement and can't wait to see what she does next. Um, next, um, I would like to recognize um, from Park Hill South High School, Audrey Robinson, who earned the Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange Award. Uh, this earns her a spot in a competitive study abroad program for a full year. It's a, co um, it's a partnership between the U.S. Congress and the German Bundestag. Um, so she will uh, receive a uh, $15,000 scholarship um, and only 2% of the students who apply for this actually earn this award. So we're very proud of Audrey and wish her well at that ex um, opportunity to immerse herself in German culture. And then we have a very exciting staff recognition. Um, the Exemplary New Principal Award for the Greater Kansas City area is our very own Dr. Adrian Singletary. Um, we all know he's very deserving. Um, he earned this award for his commitment to excellence in his school community, for actively developing programs that meet each student's needs, for developing firm connections with parents, staff, and the overall community, which I think we can all see that in him. So congratulations to Dr. Singletary and congratulations to those students. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, we'll move on to public comments. During this part of our agenda, we will receive public comments from patrons attending in person, followed by comments received in writing by the noon deadline today. You understand we didn't have any email comments. No today. email today. Okay. But we do have one. Okay. Tonight. There will be a three minute time limit for individual comments and a 15 minute total time limit for all comments combined. OPAL will monitor the time. When called upon by the board president, 
Patrons are displayed approach the presenter station, speak into the microphone, and state your name and address before making comments. If a response is appropriate, I will respond or refer to another individual. It should be noted that in an effort to respect privacy, comments should refrain from discussing personal complaints involving individual staff members or students. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Gwen Van Asselt. And did you say my address also? Mm -hmm, please. 4317 Northwest 63rd Terrace, Kansas City, Missouri 64151. I recently read in the board update email that discussion about the need for a 12th elementary school is beginning. As our community begins this process, I ask that the board offer thoughtful leadership and ensure good stewardship of our resources. As many of you probably remember, and archives from Park Hill Listen show our community is firmly behind economic balance in our schools. Additionally, economic balance has been a redistricting criteria in our school for many years, far before I had school aged children. My oldest child, who was a second grader for the first time when I was involved the first time with a community wide group here in Park Hill, concerned about economic balance in our local schools in Park Hill. He'll graduate from Park Hill South this year. Our community has communicated clearly to each of you. However, we still don't have a policy to define and ensure balance. As a result, in the fall of 2018, each of the final six elementary redistricting scenarios made poverty concentration worse in our district. Following the fall 2018 redistricting process, I came here and I offered a list of considerations. Number five on the list submitted requested a district, district policy on poverty concentration to be used as guidance when school boundaries are drawn. I ask that the board works to create this policy now so it can be established prior to the need for redistricting again. We all know the time to define and set goals is prior to the beginning of a process, not during a process that can become emotional and overly influenced by self-interest. Additionally, I recently read through our district's comprehensive school improvement plan. One a, minute. A policy to ensure economic balance in our school puts actions to words like high expectations, financial sustainability, quality staff, visionary leadership, equity, and integrity. Don't behave like these are fluffy buzzwords. This is your charge. I brought a copy of the considerations I shared in the fall of 2018, along with a little information about economic balance in schools and the demonstrated need in Park Hill for a policy on economic balance. Feel free to reach out to me if you have more questions. Thank you. If you don't mind taking one of these, Dr. Redinger, and passing them around. Thank you. Just Thank give you. those to, if you would, just give those to Ms. Hibbs and we'll distribute them afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Is that all? Pieces? That was, that's all we had. Okay. We'll move to the consent agenda. This evening's consent agenda includes item, items 5.1 through 5.15. Dr. Coward, are there items that need highlighted? Just a couple I would. Just in personnel, we do have uh, two of our uh, 219 or 10 month uh, assistant principal hires. Uh, Dr. Shiloh Dutton will be going to Park Hill High School and Melvin Walker will become the new assistant principal at Park Hill South. And I'd also recognize the retirement of uh, Jennifer Holden. She has been with the district for many, many years. She's in the English department, but she also did our speech and debate. And we're very uh, sad to lose her. She is taking a wonderful position in Greenwood uh, in the, in the, with the Missouri State University. So, but we just want to congratulate her too. So thank you. Board, do you have any questions for Dr. Calvert? I would need a motion and second to approve consent agenda items 5.1 through 5.15 as presented. So moved. Second. I have a motion for Mr. Klein and a second by Ms. Reed to approve the consent agenda as presented. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. Motion carries 7-0. Move on to action items, or further along in action items. <laughs> Um, 6.2, adoption of Central Bank of Midwest Organizational Certificates and Directive Resolutions and Addendum. And this is just a yearly thing as we renew our board officers. And so starting July 15th, Mr. Monsis is finishing his 
a term, and uh, Mrs. Reed will start that on July 15th. So this is just to approve and get our paperwork correct. So I'll need a motion and second to adopt the Central Bank of the Midwest Organizational Certification <laughs> and Directive Resolutions and Addendum Sorry. and grant authorization for the individual's name to exercise certain powers relative to bank accounts listed on the resolutions. So moved. Second. Motion for Mrs. Whitley and a second by Mr. Klein. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say aye. Any opposed say nay. Motion carries 7 0. <clears throat> 6.3 approval of the 2020 2021 budget amendments and transfers. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Kelly. We've been talking about this since August or since April, and so you've had several uh, presentations on this topic. And we'll be talking today about just those amendments and transfers that are required at the end of the year. So, Dr. Kelly, please. All right, so uh, Dr. Coward mentioned earlier that uh, this has been adjusted. I've highlighted the three numbers that changed from um, this morning when it was posted uh, to this afternoon when it was posted. And there was a, a couple transactions that we uh, wanted to get in before the end of the year. Um, just so you know, we have quite a bit of activity still left in the, uh, in the month of June. And so having a board meeting on Thursday um, is probably, um, the third day on the 24th is actually probably the worst case scenario for us because it leaves a lot of days for us to continue to be making <coughs> expenditures. And so um, what you have in front of you um, with those corrections is really not talking at all about next year's budget. That'll be our next item on the agenda. But yet this is to uh, do a little house cleaning on uh, the budget that was approved a year ago. So we brought to you a budget that you see in this column. And in the state of Missouri, the Board of Education in each of the public school districts is required to approve a budget by fund. In this case, um, we have these listed by what's called subfund. So these are uh, buckets of money um, uh, in which we separate, and each one of them has their own requirements and, and, and um, uh, legislation around sort of how those dollars can be utilized, how revenue comes in, and how expenditures can be made from them. So the board at that time, uh, a year ago, had approved these values, and so those correspond to a board action in June of 2020. And so what we're actually asking for, um, two things. One is to amend the budget to these numbers. And you can see that um, the amendments, almost in every case, we're actually asking you to amend the budget downward. And that is because uh, almost in every single one of these funds, we spent less than we had planned. Um, the counter to that is that when you look at the revenue sheet, you'll see that we also made, uh, brought in less revenue than we had planned too. So uh, it's not all just less uh, expenditures. but. Uh, some of this might be very obvious as you look through these funds. Um, I'll skip that first one, but the student activities funds being 1.2 million under, that is primarily because there was less student activity um, with three quarters of having alternating days at the secondary schools. There was just less fundraisers. There was less, uh, and this is the fund that we bring in activity dollars as parents um, or family come to athletic events and those kinds of things. And so. Uh, just less uh, dollars um, were brought in and then also less expensed. Um, food service, that should not be a surprise for the very same reason due to COVID. Uh, we just actually, participation was way down, so we, we spent less on food and labor. Um, likewise, in uh, community services, this would include preschool, adventure club, community ed, and the aquatic center, uh, same, same uh, things in which participation was down. Um, these two, that, the, this one, which is really the largest here that we're going to ask oops, uh, to go downward is in fund one. And there's really two primary reasons why that is so, such a large number, $3.3 million down. And that is um, we have a technology initiative in which we decided uh, this spring to, rather than do a three-year maintenance cycle, we decided to do a four-year and extend the life of a set of uh, laptops. And that, that actually did save us money, but also that expenditure now will be moved to next year. So when you approve the budget for next year, some of those dollars that are seen as savings here 
uh, will actually be expense, uh, expense next year and planned for next year's budget. Uh, the other piece of that, so that the technology is about uh, two thirds of that, and then the other part is kind of this big umbrella around travel and professional development and those kinds of things. Uh, obviously with COVID, there was just limitations on what we could do um, with professional development, training, and um, travel out of state. So um, that was a fairly large piece of uh, that, um, tra uh, that um, uh, amendment. Uh, and then in special revenue, almost all of this surprisingly maybe is in substitute teachers. So uh, we just had uh, about half the expenditure this year that we would in a quote unquote normal year on substitute teachers. And so that is now reflected in um, a request to amend the budget downward. The thing that is maybe will be a little surprising is that you, as you look at next year's budget, you'll look at the operating budget and say, oh my gosh, like compared to this year, that this, these are big jumps. And that's because this year is such an oddity. Uh, this is really an anomaly almost in every single one of those funds. Um, for and COVID is the direct reason for that. Um, you can see debt service is uh, relatively close. That included a, that very large refinance, and so um, we're uh, not as much, but we're asking for you also to amend that downward. And then in capital, that actually reflects some projects that we thought we would be able to expense in June, but actually probably won't uh, now until July, which now becomes an expense in next year's budget. The one uh, budget that we're actually asking for you to amend higher than what you originally approved is in bond. And this actually has to do with the fact that we were unable to make expenditures last June that we had anticipated. And so those expenditures occurred in July. And so there was just much more spending in July and August and September than we had anticipated because um, some of those expenditures were delayed from last year. We had anticipated them in last year's budget. So overall, this is technically the first step of what we're asking is the amendment of um, the 2020-2021 budget to these values. The auditor then would <coughs> will take these values as your budget and then perform the audit based upon those numbers um, when the auditors start their work this fall, um, starting to look backwards. So really, these dollars will become uh, obsolete, they will no longer look at those and the audit will be performed on, on the amended budget. Um, this next table is really more for information purposes and really it is there's no new information. Debt and bond are extracted and so you can see this is what would be just operating. So these numbers should be exactly the same as above with the exception that debt and bond are pulled out. And so this is a picture of operating. This is really more, like I said, more for information purposes because the action is really more oriented around this column right here in terms of amending the budget. This whole next page is really just giving you a snapshot on revenue. Um, in Missouri, you are not asked as a board to approve a revenue budget, but certainly you would want to see a revenue budget uh, just to make sure that you have money uh, to approve the uh, expenditure budget. But so there is no formal action on this tonight. So this is for information purposes only. And so we're not asking for any amendment to this. Uh, but this does show you a, a, a bit of what we expect our performance to budget to be. A couple things maybe of note. This operating um, number is a little high higher and the primary purpose of that or the reason for that 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 happened was that you might remember in um, the fall August of last year we moved some money out of debt service levy because the Hancock amendment allowed us to roll our operating up our operating levy so the board had approved um, kind of the expectation of this amount and then we had made a lot of changes to the um, tax levy in August and I suspect we will do that again this August uh, but that's maybe a conversation for the next board item. But um, anyway, so that we actually were able to pull more in. You see, we did not um, make uh, what we had anticipated here in um, capital. And so we were pretty significantly under there in revenue. And so really the net effect, those are the two <coughs> operating funds that we have tax levies in. So the net effect there is that um, you know, we, we had brought in about two million and primarily that is in current tax. Um, 
the other effect was that debt service is significantly under. We had expected um, to have a larger uh, levy in it, but we actually moved some of it out and were able to put it into capital and um, operating. And so you can see that we did not meet our expectation in revenue here. And so um, that is why um, you can see a, a smaller number there. Um, you know, the others, um, you know, the CARES money really did satisfy much of this. I think really the one thing that does stand out for me, I don't know if you took note of it, but in food service, I think there's been a question that when, uh, you know, a year ago when the federal government announced that they would take on the expenditures of all school lunches about what impact that would have on our lunch program, would that cause us to have a, a loss in money? Uh, would, that be, uh, would that be a way for us to make money in the food service program? Um, just from a phys on a fiscal basis, you see that we expect to receive $4.9 million in revenue. If I can kind of roll up here and show you what um, we expect in expenditures, we're at five. And so that's great, actually. Um, and so that is uh, relatively close. I mean, every year it's, it, 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 we don't typically get that close. I might be even a little conservative on this, but I, I think it would be safe to say just based upon these numbers that that was not a net negative for our school lunch program, despite the fact that we served quite a bit fewer lunches. Uh, participation was down. Also, and I don't know that this had to do with COVID, but just or indirectly with COVID, but our, we had a really hard time filling positions at our nutrition services department, and so our labor costs were not as high as we had anticipated, and so that also kept our expenditures lower than, than they normally would have been. So that's um, kind of a snapshot of, of, of revenue. Again, this is operating. Um, again, same values, but uh, just pull out debt service and uh, bond. The other piece of the recommendation tonight is this, this fund transfer. And so um, this strange number right here is actually a calculation uh, from the state of Missouri. And so one of, there's many transfers, but one of the, um, one of the transfers that the, the uh, state allows is this one that they've entitled greater of 162,326 or 7% times SAT times prior year WADA. So they could work on the title of it, <laughs> but it is, kind of gives you a glimpse that it's a formula based upon um, on, on your, um, the state adequacy target and your attendance from the prior year. And so every school district obviously would have a different value, but you're able to pull money out of fund one where most districts bring in most of their money and move that money down into um, fund four. So basically we'll pull some of this money that we received and actually just do a transfer here at the end of the year. And the reason why you would do that is so that you can make some, um, you can make some uh, numbers and, and metrics and targets around fund balances. And so in Park Hill, we are always looking at our operating fund balance and our capital fund balance. And so with that transfer in place, if the transfer wasn't able to be made, we would end up with far more money in fund one than, and we would be above the 22% threshold. Uh, but with the transfer, and, and then we would be far lower, we would be $5 million less here and we would be outside of our range. And so that without that transfer, we would not hit either one of these targets. This number would be way too high and this number would be low, too low for Park Hill standards. And so we're using the transfer to get both of those within the ranges that we've adopted. <coughs> so we're asking uh, for your approval tonight on, on this first action, which is to amend the budget to these values for 2020-2021 and to approve a transfer up to uh, $5.145 million uh, from fund one to fund four. All right, <clears throat> I'll need a motion and a second to approve the 2020-2021 budget amendments and transfers as presented and appoint Dr. Coward, Dr. Kelly, and Scott Monses, board treasurer, to assign fund balances and identify commitments of the balances. So moved. Second. A motion for Mr. Klein and a second by Ms. Reed. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Ms. Mrs. Newberger. <coughs> Mrs. 
Susan? <coughs> yeah, any opposed say nay. Motion carries 6 0. And now we'll move to adoption of the 2021 2022 budget. It's going to be 2021 20, on the thing, it says 2020 2021. 20, 21 2022. Yeah, it's, it's on the thing here. 21 22. Yes. Okay. 20, yeah, 21 22. Our tab is wrong. Okay. All right. Um, so this is. Um, these are the values that we're asking for you to approve uh, in each one of the funds. And so, like I said in the last item, boards in the state of Missouri approve a budget by fund. So the, um, you can see here that each one, I've listed each one of these funds um, you know, to the dollar, and this will serve as the basis kind of as our spending plan for next year. You do not see a revenue budget here, and that is that, but you do see that detailed, of course, in the, the larger um, material that is provided and if, uh, for your reference and of course there's all kinds of uh, other information in the budget manual we write that according to a set of national standards um, the uh, Association of School Business Officials meritorious budget award uh, standards and so that is a fairly um, standardized set of uh, set of information that you will find in that budget book I'm not going to pull it up as you may have noticed it's 500 pages and so I don't have uh, enough time for that but um, anyway the uh, we would expect maybe the one thing that you would see that stands out a little bit is that we do expect revenue to be a little bit higher than expenditures next year I would say that that is a direct effect of um, the ESSER monies that we are at least at now planning to receive all of next year uh, both ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 and so then basically would use those as operating funds that would then kind of bridge uh, not just for next year but then the following year and so we would use uh, if in fact these are um, these values uh, kind of bear out uh, by the end of the year um, we would use that those dollars to add to the fund balance um, and we would then of course utilize those dollars in, in the years following None of these uh, are substantially different than what we've shown you in at the end of May, and then again last uh, at the last meeting. These are fairly consistent. We've obviously made some tweaks um, over the last couple of weeks, but nothing substantial um, from what you've seen in prior presentations. Okay. I'll need a motion and second to adopt, adopt the 2021-2022 district budget as presented and listed by fund. So moved. Second. I have a motion for Ms. Reed and a second by Mr. Klein. Any discussion? I have a technical question. It's been pointed out that when you open the document, it has the wrong title at the top. It looks like a piece of metadata says 2020-2021. Are we actually approving the PDF or are we just approving the numbers? The numbers. Okay, then. You change fine. the PDF later. Yeah. Yes, and okay. I thought that that's that's been, I think it's it's correct when you pull it up and see the document, yeah. mm -hmm. but it's just on the tab within the uh, electronic school board system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where is that? It's right, right at the there. very tab, that very tab right there in the black, right, right there. there. And up above. That's right. Yeah, so, but if you see the budget, it says 21. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's from the. It's the PDF title. Okay. I mean, on okay. that. We will correct I'll that. I'll make a note of that. So I apologize for that. And if we could, Mrs. Newberger. She, they're having storms. Or she is. So even though I show her hair, she's lost connection. Any other questions? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Motion carries 6-0. Move on to information written items. Items 7.1 through 7.3 are bids, <laughs> contracts, agreement, and item 7.4 is capital planning guiding principles. And the board will be asked to take action on these items at the July 29th regular meeting. We have questions from Dr. Coward. And if you would to on the 7.4 on the capital planning guiding principles, we did have some requests at the last meeting. Uh, regarding tax levies and tax where we are on that tax fee so 
I've asked Dr. Kelly to pull that up for us, please, and we're going to share that with you first. <coughs> and then we also, uh, you gave us feedback last time on those guiding principles, and we've gotten other feedback since that time, so we want to make sure we have everything captured that you want on those guiding principles. And so we will look at those second, uh, and I will share with you the recommendations that I have received about changes, and then see if there are any other changes that you'd like to have made before the July meeting. So, uh, Dr. Keller, do you mind pulling up those attachments on that? Are you able to? Yep. So uh, the first uh, request, I think if you might remember, we had in, in the presentation um, on the Monday, um, was it June? Work session. The work session, June 5th, or um, at the first of the month, the uh, work session, we had highlighted these orange values. And so with the, the it's the orange that <coughs> is the part of the levy that goes back to pay directly for uh, bond issues. And so what we were trying to show is the difference between the Park Hill School District's debt service levy compared to our surrounding school districts. And in that case, we would we rank not only at the la bottom of this list, but significantly uh, lower than all of our counterparts. Uh, the request then was to look at the total tax rate. And so this then incorporates the operating tax of each school district in that case then you can see that we rank 10th um, out of 12 of the same 12 school districts um, in the total tax rate. And so you can kind of see how those are separated out. So we're very much more um, heavily uh, proportionately uh, within our operating tax rate um, is represented here. So that's one uh, piece of information. This is for 2020, 2021. Of course, these will change again next year. So every August, September, these will kind of be reset. But each school district will have to go through that. And in Platte County, I would imagine both Platte County and R3 and Park Hill are probably going to see some significant changes due to Hancock because of reassessment. That may be true in other districts as well, but uh, I know I know that Platte County has gone through quite a bit. So then the other piece of information that was requested was where Park Hill has been on that total tax levy over time. And so I went all the way back to 2002. So we have about 19 years here um, of data. And why that was relevant is that that was actually the last time that the voters approved a tax increase in Park Hill, which was April of, 20, of 2002. Um, and so when the voters voted, the, the result of the combination of debt service and operating was 565.32. And then since then, um, as you'll see on our next slide, but since then it has just dropped over time. This has been through a combination of the Han uh, Hancock Amendment, which requires us to do so. And there's also instances here when the board has taken voluntary rollbacks. Um, and so that is the net effect. So we are about a quarter, 25 cents less than we were um, in 2002. We are the only district, uh, and you'll see this on the next slide, that has actually a, a levy that is uh, less today than it was in 2002. So any questions? That was the, those were the questions that I think we had or the data that you had requested to help um, kind of with formulating the guiding principles. I kind of, uh, on the next one, I took uh, the liberty to combine both of those sets of data just to show you what I was kind of just uh, alluding to there, which was, well, what have tax levies done across the city over the la that same time, spirit, uh, time mm -hmm. period since 2002? And so, again, Park Hill is in, the, in blue, and so you can kind of see the, the same effect here, which is about a, about a quarter less than it was in 2002. The yellow line is Platte County R3, and you can see what's happened over time. The gray is North Kansas City School District, and you can kind of see it kind of crisscrosses, um, and it's now at 6.2. Uh, uh, Liberty is the orange line here, and so I've pulled uh, those <coughs> school districts out specifically and just showed you those with Park Hill. And then the black line actually includes all four of those districts as well as the <coughs> list of school districts here. So it, not only is it Liberty, North Kansas City, Park Hill, and Platte County are three, but also Fort Osage, Blue Springs, Lee Summit, Hickman Mills, Raytown, Grandview, Independence Center. 
And so that is what is represented. So, so these are the 12 school districts uh, in the city. And so you see there's that, the, that overall this trend is clearly that over the last 20 years, um, the, the pattern has been that school districts tax, taxes have increased with the one exception of Parkville. So Dr. Dr. Kelly, when we, when we look at this and we think about this, is it is the assessed value that really drives the equation here, though, right? Because maybe more telling would be would be not just to look at the rate, but to look at the uh, how the assessed values of the properties across these districts have fared over time. I know that we we have the good fortune that our base continues to grow, and we've got a great mix of business and residential. Whereas some of these other districts may have exclusively residential and they're not their assessed value would not be growing. So yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm just thinking apples to apples here if we're really looking at this, there's kind of a deeper meaning that drives these these percentages. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, everything you said I, I'm on board with uh, the I mean we are um, I think you started off by saying we're, we're blessed because of the tax base has allowed this to happen. So um, in a tax base, that's not to say that liberty isn't growing. So liberty is growing. Right. But the phenomenon that's occurring in liberty is that a uh, couple things, which is hard to depict in this tax rate, but one is they're growing so fast that they have exceeded their debt limit. And so one of the ways that they could address that then is through increasing their operating tax levy and so that so <coughs> that's one of the things that you see on the Liberty line which is that it, they're impacted by their rate of growth they also have a far different mix in which is more heavily residential than Park Hill and then why that's a problem is that residential properties is, is uh, classified as a, at a 19% rate and commercials at 33% um, so but having more commercial is better also because commercial doesn't directly bring students into and call it in the need for more expenditures and more buildings and those kinds of things. So having a large amount of commercial is, um, or a good mix of residential and commercial has been a blessing for Park Hill. That would really be an envy of probably all the other districts that you see here. And you then know. our predictable growth rate, because we our long range planning, it makes it easier for us to plan, right? Because we've had such consistent growth. Right. Yeah, yeah I, I think the fact that we're also landlocked which is limited you know we, we don't have these sprawling acres of of land that that we're just can continuously continuously build out and so that's kind of forced us to go pretty slow with it and also a lot of the property that is available is being developed for commercial um, so <coughs> that has kind of uh, there just hasn't been the housing available frankly to to move into Park Hill like it has been in Liberty in, in North Kansas City so um, so all of that is is accurate you know this I think on this graphic is a bit of a misrepresentation I, I thought it was interesting that you know we last time we consulted with uh, Piper Sandler about you know what could we do uh, into the future looking at a tax a no tax increase bond issue and how much do we think that how much more debt do we think we could take on without changing that tax levy and so at the time, um, my recollection was that they said that a safe value at that time was about 60, um, 60 million dollars. And so that is uh, kind of serves as a baseline. If we were to just take, um, for example, the impact of just going from 539.55 back to what was approved by the voters in 2002, so basically moving that tax levy up a quarter would actually move the ability for us to, um, if successfully passed, we could pass about a 130 to 140 million dollar bond issue. So uh, that 25 cents would uh, would make a gigantic impact on how much debt we could make. If we were to dream of, of needing even more than 130 or 140 and just bring our tax levy up to the average, frankly we couldn't <coughs> legally issue enough debt to ever need the average. That goes back to your tax base thing, mm -hmm. is that there is no scenario in which that would be, that we would exceed our 15% um, debt limit. So, um, 
So, so the impact of that quarter, while on this graph looks pretty minor and just looking, we're talking about really small numbers, decimal numbers, difference here, a quarter in the tax rate would make, you know, um, you know, about $70 million difference in terms of what we could issue in bonds. So that was uh, the, the set of information that I think was requested to kind of assist you in kind of looking at the guiding principles as we move forward with um, capital projects. And then Dr. Kelly on that yeah. last one too, the, at the end there the, with the aggregate of all the districts and then I think you probably noticed Park, or, uh, North Kansas City has that drop. <clears throat> of course that's back to the Jackson County phenomenon that happened last year during all their, or the year before in the reassessment, I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly which year it was. 2019. 2019 that went into that one uh, that plays into that and I think the other part that's that we'll be talking about as we get our tax information at the end of July first part of August is when we talk about Hancock amendment uh, that understanding that the school districts cannot benefit from that we cannot get those windfalls and that's why you see those rollbacks and those things so we have to stay we have to stay where we are and I think that's that's a part of a, a communication piece that we'll work on with our communities because if, if I'm seeing my assessed valuation continue to go up, my assumption is you must be getting a lot more money. <clears throat> and so that's why those things change. Is there more because of growth? Yes. Yes. But is there more as far as levies and those types of things? So we want to we be careful about how we talk about that and uh, make sure that we articulate that. I think that's interesting and in going back to what Todd said as well, because mm -hmm. um, it, you do hear that complaint that even though our tax rate is low, we pay more taxes because our assessment is higher, but I always think, well, part of the reason your home is worth more is because of the school district in Park Hill. So it's kind of, uh, I don't want to say circular reasoning, but mm -hmm. it's uh, very related. The other piece that plays into us, and actually Mr. Monsas and I had some conversation about this, there's other taxing jurisdictions, the city of Kansas City versus the city of Riverside versus, versus Parkville. So because we have so many different municipalities in our community too, also gives just different rates and different just different levels for everyone and so it really does depend on which part of our district you live in <coughs> I, I, there's still other other like, taxing jurisdictions yeah, that are happening that are playing into that and so you know the Kansas City earnings tax if you for example worked at Park Hill South and didn't live in the Kansas City but lived in Parkville you wouldn't pay the Kansas City earnings tax but and so it's just weird how those things play out for us and so we just have all those different pieces that we have to play with there too so Olin, um, we're having some technology difficulty and our slides have not been showing to the public. And so they asked me to just announce that we will edit the live stream and get those slides up. But I we believe we had a system go down. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Any questions about that? We just wanted to answer, respond to that. And just uh, as we continue to learn more, we'll just uh, we'll share and continue to learn. I think that's. For me, it's just this is a long process that we're in, and so making sure that we have all the information that we have would be the best. So, okay. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. If we could go to the uh, capital planning guiding principles um, that are posted, apparently. We'll be able to see them here, and I apologize if they can't. They'll be posted for you soon. We did have a couple of updates for you, and so I just want to highlight the ones that we had comments on last time and changes we made. So the first one was actually on number three. So the prior version is listed for you in red, and then you can see the, um, the updated version, and part of what we were trying to capture there was just for our students, you know, the, the care for our students and their overall well-being, and so that was really is what we were trying to capture on that. I, I hope we did that, but if we missed it, please, please let us know. Is there any changes that you'd like to see to that, or does that meet the board's wishes? You guys are good? Okay. okay. Uh, the next one was actually number five, and the key term on that one that we discussed last time was around preservation. And so we actually shifted that, and we took it out and had optimal utilization of buildings and facilities, but feedback that I received actually from our board officers meeting. And I, I think this is a great piece because this has been a core piece for our community, would actually be adding the word and maintenance. So opt optimal utilization and maintenance of our buildings and facilities. That's an important piece for us. And so if the boards, with the boards, if that's the board's pleasure, uh, we would recommend adding maintenance into that. What are your thoughts on that? Does that work? Everybody? 
What was the reasoning behind uh, changing the maintenance from preservation? The preservation, I think part of the challenge on preservation, if you are if you in a district that where you've had older buildings, sometimes those become an issue of don't ever change that and preserve. So preservation can be interpreted many different ways. And so uh, preservation I get is making sure you're taking care of it, I think was the intent of this originally. And so is maintenance really what we're talking about here? Take care of what you've got and take care of what you've been given, basically. Okay. Not necessarily preserve it into perpetuity. Got it. <laughs> Everyone's okay with that one? Mm -hmm. I'm seeing nods, thank you. Okay, we will make that adjustment. And then number six, um, managing, it was a managing school enrollment, and that's an interesting word, and we should have caught that. We really can't control school enrollment, <laughs> but we can manage our population and how we use our facilities. And so that was really the main change on that. Uh, also allowing for those diverse and varied school programs, programs and activities. We know that our students are involved in many, many, many things. And so we want to make sure we're meeting that. So school population instead of school enrollment. What are your thoughts on that? Would it be better even to put manage building population? Sure, we can do any of those. School pop population still sounds like general school population. Does it sound too wide, like more district versus individual school population? We have buildings, though, that have staff in them and um, have been challenged in the past. So it really is about managing the building population, right? I mean, it's one of the reasons why we had to build our um, support sure. services space so that we had adequate workspace for our staff. Sure. I think diverse and varied are very similar in meaning and mm -hmm. I think relevant. I think curriculums need to change fast because I think, you know, I, I think of how fast the workplace is changing and I know that we're very focused on career and college readiness and so um, I don't know if relevant would make more sense but I think it might be more aligned with some of the things that we're measuring. So I, I throw that out there for consideration. I don't think a decision needs to be made right away on that, but. So, so where would that word go, Mr. Yeah. Fain? Would you replace well, varied, 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 with varied with relevant? Yes. Is that your recommendation? I think I would. Board thoughts on that? We'd like to be relevant. <laughs> that would be important. <laughs> Okay. okay. I think it's okay because the word diverse is there, so I think that. I think varied has a little bit different meaning, but probably not enough for me to advocate that it stays in as well as relevant, so okay. I'm fine. Okay, we'll do that. Thank you for that. Unless Appreciate anyone else feels like Anybody else have a strong feeling about that one either way? Group editing is always a lot of fun, so <laughs> make sure we get this done. I had the same thought as, as Ms. Boland, but, but since diverse is right there, I think Okay. I'm okay with that. Is there any value to saying diverse, varied, and relevant? We can put all much? three in. We can do That's all three. That's a lot. Okay. I'm good with just relevant. Okay. Diverse and relevant. And we're going to change school to building population is what I understand. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the final one was provide facil facilities um, consistent with that to meet the future needs of all programs. And before, uh, we wanted to, we added the all programs. So making sure that not just specific one program or the other, but what are we doing for all of our programs? And uh, what are your thoughts on that updated version there? So I think we have shared facilities between schools. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that captures that because it seems like we're comparing each schools as opposed to maybe between districts. Well, I know that that's been a recent issue. Uh, you know, members of our community have brought that to our attention. And I think that's the consistent with the benchmark school districts. So that would be those outside of us. And that's why, as you looked at those we're looking at on our tax levy pieces, okay. that's what that benchmark, and that's, that's what we're hearing from our community. And so that's why we wanted to put benchmark districts in there. Yeah. We don't need to compare with Dallas, Texas, but we should compare with what's close to us. Mm -hmm. Any other feedback or thought on that? Anything else that we missed that that we didn't capture? We tried to take every, we tried to take co good notes and make sure we hit everything. Uh, if we've missed something, please let us know. Dr. Carr, can you read number five in its updated form? Protect the taxpayer's financial investment through the optimal utilization and maintenance of buildings and facilities. Thank you. That capture the what we're looking for. 
Okay, we will update this and then this will come to you at the July meeting. And again, as the board, you can always make adjustments at that time before you approve too. So we'll make those adapt those updates. Thank you so much for your feedback. It really has been helpful. Thank you. 8.0 public comments. Are there any patrons that wish to address the board regarding any items from tonight's posted agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on to board member reports and requests. Mrs. Newberger, are you still there? Uh, yeah, I am. Nothing. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Woodley? None, thank you. Mr. Klein? None, thank you. Mr. Monsess? None, thank you. Ms. Reed? None, thank you. Mr. Fain? None, thank you. Um, I will just report that a number of us went to the MSBA meeting uh, last weekend, Ig Igniting Great Ideas mm -hmm. Summit, but kind of just their semi-annual meeting, um, and appreciate all the work that the district did to get us there, and um, I thought it was productive, at least productive time together and uh, good information shared, so. Uh. Also recognize that the board, and we'll recognize that in July, but did uh, oh, yeah. receive the, the Team Governance Award at that time. And uh, Mrs. Woodley, thank you for, con you finished your uh, board member certifications and training, so we appreciate <laughs> that too, it's always good. Um, for those of us that are there, I guess if you feel like there's any relevant information to pass along, um, there was some valuable information so um, I guess if we if you think of things to be shared uh, you can send them maybe to Opal to include in a Friday report or, or something so um, that's all I had um, we do have closed session so I will need a motion and second to adjourn to closed session pursuant to chapter 610 section 21 of the revi revised Missouri statutes for the purpose of discussing Matters relevant to subsections 1, legal, and 3 and 13, personnel. So moved. Second. A motion from Mr. Klein and a second by Ms. Woodley. Ms. Hibbs, please call the roll. Bolin. Yes. Fain. Yes. Klein. Yes. Monses. Yes. Woodley. Yes. Reed. Yes. And uh, let's come back at 7.30. And remember to turn your mics off and try to remain seated until the live stream fades.